Good morning. Here we are at our Ephesians study for this week. And uh, I need to remember to send all the links out from last week to everyone, too. Well, I'll try to remember. Write it on my hand or something. So, Okay, we're at Ephesians 4, and today we want to talk about verse 3 in particular. Um, well, actually, it's verses 1 through 3, which we started looking at last time. But uh, the emphasis being this time in this phrase in verse 3, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. So this matter of, the, of what Paul calls the unity of the Spirit, important subject. So let's pray and we'll start. Father, we come to your word now and we ask your blessing on our time as we study the scriptures. We pray that you would uh, increase our faith that we would come to your word um, believing it, believing you, uh, ready to obey your word, and that you would use your word to uh, in further enlighten and illumine our minds that we might know you better. And uh, we pray this all in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> So when I when, was in, when we lived in Montana and I was pastor of our first church there, um, I've probably told, you've probably heard me tell this story before, but it's just a good example of relating to this subject, the unity of the Spirit. Um, the, uh, so I was there and, and there was a couple of other pastors about 30 miles to the south of us, and one of them... Uh, a uh, uh, Lutheran pastor. He was in Elka. That's a large. Call it, they call themselves evangelicals, but they're really rather liberal. Anyway, uh, wanted me to meet with them and talk about a kind of a joint ministry, preaching ministry of some kind in the community. At any rate, um, the. Uh, I ended up, and I think it was not that long ago, I think I told you this story, but I had asked them, when I did meet with them, I asked them what they believed about the Bible. Did they believe that it was the infallible, inerrant Word of God? Well, to make a long story short, they didn't. They kind of beat around the bush or whatever, and uh, but, they, but they didn't. And so... Um, I thought about it some more, and later on I, I wrote each of them a note back and just said, no, I can't, I can't work in a, together with you in the Lord's ministry because uh, we don't have common ground. You don't acknowledge the Bible as the inspired and errant word of God. And, uh, and the Lutheran guy, you know, he had been the pastor of a pretty large church at one time. He was kind of semi-retired now. But at any rate, uh, he said that, well, you know, um, then you're violating, you're, you're disregarding our Lord's prayer when he prayed that they all be one, right? Uh, in fact, you can see, let's, look, let's take a look back at that passage. I think that's in John 17, in the high priestly prayer. Let's see, I go down through here. Um, and. <clears throat> What's that? Clarify what kind of Lutheran. Oh, yeah, I said Elka, evangelical, yeah, a liberal Lutheran. <coughs> There's conservative Lutherans that do believe the Bible is the inerrant Word of God. Um, and. So I'm trying to, oh, there we are. Okay, now see this. Now, Jesus in the high priestly prayer is praying for us, for his elect. That's who he's going to die for, okay? You can, you can go back and you can read uh, chapter 17 and you'll see that that is the case. He doesn't pray for everybody. He specifically says that. He's praying for the ones that God has, the Father has given to him, all right? Now, um, for, the, uh, for the elect. And then in verse 21, then he says uh, that, that they may all be one. 
just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent you have sent me. So this guy he came back and said, Well, you know, you're Jesus prayed that we would be one. And now you're not willing to be one with us, you see. You you're not gonna join together with us and do this ministry together. Well, what kind of oneness, what kind of unity was that guy talking about? Was he talking about the unity, the oneness that uh, Jesus was praying for here or some other? Well, he was talking about some other kind of unity. It was a unity, think about it now, it was a his kind of unity is this ecumenical thing where let's let's all of us that claim to be Christians get together, form an organization that and and we'll 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 get this thing going, and as we're working together, then then we're answering Jesus' prayer that we all may be one. You see. Well, if you look back here. Uh, well, you, you don't even have to look past John 17, but uh, <clears throat> notice that this unity that Jesus is talking about here in 1721, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, and they also may be in us. That unity that he's praying for among for his people is is that it is the same kind of unity that's in the Trinity. The Father, the Son, as the Father is in Him, and, and are all, they're in one another, right? The three persons of the, of the Trinity. That, so obviously, this is not, He's not praying that we'd all just get together, work together, and form a big denominations kind of disregard what we believe in everything, but, you know, we'll just work together and do this ourselves. This is a unity that, where does it come from? It comes from God himself. And that's what we're seeing here. Here we'll go back here to Ephesians. Then, look at, look at what um, Paul says here eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So, in other words, this unity that Paul is exhorting us to be careful to uh, maintain, right, is not an external organizational unity of some kind that we create by us getting together and joining hands and so forth. It's already created. It, it, it's al it already exists. It, it's the unity of the Spirit. It's the oneness that has similarities to the oneness in the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's, it's the oneness in the body of Christ. It is um, the oneness that all true Christians uh, are part of an experience because the Holy Spirit in us creates it. And he's going to go on to talk about this, this oneness, this unity uh, of the Spirit. So what you have here in chapter 4, verse 3 is, and well, really before that too, but is Paul is telling us to maintain what's already there, all right? Don't mess it up with your arrogance and sin. You see, here it is. I, therefore, prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. And we looked at that doctrine of calling last time. And so um, if we are going to live like 
who we are now in Christ, the called ones, the saints, right? We need to live like that. And um, because to live in another way, to live as Paul calls it in 1 Corinthians, like mere men, right? And filled with pride and forming all these party uh, party uh, groups and so on and bickering and, and all of that sort of it's unworthy it's inconsistent with who we are now then um, in Christ and in order to do this he describes it here look living worthy of the calling to which you've been called and thereby maintaining the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace first of all requires what well, we've got to be humbled, humility, gentleness, patience, forbearing with one another, bearing with one another in love, loving, loving one another. That's how you maintain the unity of the spirit. As soon as, um, as soon as pride, self-exaltation, and so forth is allowed to enter in, well then. The unity of the spirit is is quenched, you see. So it, it, this is something that's already... So these guys that were getting a hold of me and saying, hey, come on, work together, and then they're all offended and upset when I said no. Um, their idea of unity is this, this terrible thing, ecumenical. Come on, we're all going to get together and... Uh, uh, not so much. We don't want to, you know, doctrine separates. And so we don't want, well, yeah, doctrine does separate, right? Um, but in, at any rate, okay. So, uh, yeah, here's some quotes, some good stuff here from Lloyd Jones again. His volume, uh, I don't know if it's four, whatever. Anyway, it's on chapter four, verses one to 16 on Ephesians. And he titled it Christian Unity. So this whole volume here uh, is, on, is on this theme, Unity then um, in, in the Spirit. So, um, and one of the things Lloyd-Jones brings up is he said, well, why this big thing of right off the bat, first priority almost of the unity of the Spirit? So Paul is telling us, I therefore... In light of all the doctrine I've just given you in chapters 1 through 3, all right, this great salvation that Christ has affected us in us, I am urging you, <coughs> walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you've been called. And then um, he puts the... Uh, well, he starts talking right away about humility and gentleness and patience and so forth. But all of those things relate to this thing, the unity of the Spirit. Eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And as Lloyd-Jones mentioned, uh, he said, I wonder why Paul put unity of the Spirit, maintaining the unity of the Spirit, like at the top of the list. Why, you know, you think, well, maybe... Walking in a manner worthy of the calling is don't do that sin and don't do that sin and so forth. But, and, and that's true, but, but the first thing he gives priority to is this eagerness to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And, uh, and so why is that? Well, as Lloyd-Jones mentioned, and I think it, it's correct, is that, as he says, sin, what does sin do? It divides. When God created man in the first place, uh, he made them, man and woman, one flesh, right? And the, cre the creation was, um, you might say, one in him. It was characterized by unity. There wasn't any sin. There wasn't any war. There wasn't any separation. That's what sin does. It separates it separates man from God, and it separates man from man. It's what it does. So it makes sense then that one of the very first effects of uh, of this the 
new creation, when Christ makes us new creations in him, and as he moves his plan of redemption along until ultimately there will be a new, a new heavens and a new earth, a new creation, and a new humanity, really, um, it will be characterized by unity. One is no more of this horrible separation stuff. And so right now, as Christians in this present world, as citizens of the kingdom of God, in a kingdom of light in this present darkness, we are, we are to live as citizens of the new heavens and the new, the new creation. And it's characterized by unity. How, how think about it, how, what, what kind of an effect do churches have who claim to be born again, who claim to be followers of Christ and so on, um, what kind of an effect or witness do they have to the world if there's no true unity in the fruit of that unity, that unity among the pro produced by the Holy Spirit? But instead, what churches so often do is they don't um, evidence and demonstrate unity. They demonstrate division, right? And that's just the result then of sin. So much, so much division. I saw recently in a magazine I subscribed to for the, from a, re, a Reformed denomination, and there was an article in there how one of the, their member churches had withdrawn from their denomination. And the reason that they had uh, withdrawn is because they said that their, their pastor was guilty of plagiarizing in his sermons. I don't know how much of an extent or whatever, but guilty of plagiarizing. And what the denominational leaders said was, well, all right, but we have avenues in our denomination to deal with these kinds of things and and uh, the denomination and certainly this is something that can be can be handled taken care of there's no need to divide no need for you to leave the if the if the pastor acknowledges yeah i i did that i shouldn't have, i shouldn't have done that i'm sorry i repent of that and i won't do it again there but but they wouldn't drop it i mean they would not no, that, that's not satisfactory. You know, it's almost like they wanted their pound of flesh. And the thing just, just snowballed until finally, that, well, that's it. We're done with you guys. We're withdrawing from the, from the denomination and, and so on. Well, sometimes there's good reason to separate. I mean, if a denomination is going liberal on you and denying the doctrines of the faith, then obviously... Actually, they're the ones affecting the separation. But you see the point here then. If we're not, what, what, was, what was going on there in that scenario? Pride. Pride. There wasn't humility and gentleness and patience and so forth. None of that. There wasn't eagerness to maintain the unity of the Spirit. So then it's, you know, the community is going to see, oh, oh, what happened here, you know? And then they see that and, and uh, our witness for the gospel is is really is really hurt and that happens sadly then um, all the time well let's go on here and I'll show you a few more quotes here by Lloyd Jones on uh, the unity of the of the spirit here um, <clears throat> this is particularly important in our time it was in his time too it's probably he's probably going through this maybe back in the 60s somewhere in there but he says, everyone who is abreast with modern trends in the Christian church will agree that there's no subject which is being talked about so much and written about so much at the present time as this question of unity. We are in an age of so-called ecumenicity with endless talk and writing about unity unions and reunion and probably by reunion he's talking about what we've seen 
in our time, maybe what was it in the last decade or so, that ECT thing, evangelicals and Catholics together. Come on, let's see, yeah, doctrine, yeah, we've got our differences here, but but uh, we can, us Protestants and the Catholics, you know, we can, let, let's get together. So there's this ecumenical thing. Ecumen I, th I think that word ecumenical comes from the Greek word, root word for house, oikos, and it, it, it has to do with, come on, we can all live together in one house, you know, ecumenicity, that's the thing, unity. And, uh, and so jo Lloyd-Jones says, we start, let's start by observing that the Apostle Paul here is not merely appealing for some general spirit of friendship or brotherliness or camaraderie. Neither is he appealing only for some common aim or a, 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 some common goal. But the modern talk in the denominations uh, is about, about unity is entirely in those kinds of terms. It's the business of all who in any way believe in God. This is, all right, this is how the thinking goes, all right? Um, um, we're told it's the business of all who in any way believe in God to come together and to act together. We must not be too particular in regard to what we, we believe, but we must have a spirit of fellowship and friendship and of working together against the common enemy. So you see, uh, um, I was talking with a lady recently and, and she was frustrated because, um, and rightly so, because the church that she was attending um, was using materials and things that are just plain heresy, all right? But when she would bring that up and point, and point that out, they would just uh, shut her down. You know, uh, and we, we don't, you know, that's going to divide, that's going to, see, that's this whole attitude. This, what Paul is talking about, this, this unity that we are to be eager to maintain, is the unity of the Spirit. It's going to be, obviously then, entirely consistent with Scripture. Right? You, uh, doctrine only divides, doctrine only divides the, the chaff from the wheat, right? That's what it does there. But, but in regard to real Christians, people that are really in Christ, the, the Spirit produces unity, right? He, he, there's, that, there's that living bond there. And uh, he says, uh, Lloyd-Jones goes on, you can't have Christian unity unless it's based upon the great doctrines outlined in chapters 1 to 3. Therefore, the chapter begins, I therefore urge you to walk in a manner that therefore causes us to look in light of all these doctrines I've just given to you, then be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit. Really, if you think about it, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit is really akin to, almost synonymous with uh, the exhortation of uh, of being eager to maintain the unity of the spirit is to how does it go um um being zealous to see is that in james or you be being zealous for the faith once for all delivered to the saints i'm kind of paraphrasing that right but we're to be zealous to preserve the faith once for all delivered to the saints. And when we do that, it produces unity, but it produces unity among Christ's true people, right? It, it, it doesn't, I should say, it doesn't produce unity. The yeah, unity is already there, but that unity is maintained and strengthened and, and, and so on, you see. And so, um, if anyone comes to you, Lloyd-Jones says, and, and says, oh, come on, it doesn't matter uh, much, what you believe, if we call ourselves Christians, or if we believe in God in any sense, come on, let's all work together. 
then you should say to such a person in reply, but my dear sir, what about chapters 1 to 3 of the epistle to the Ephesians? What do you have to say about those doctrines there? Oh, well, I don't want, and yet this unity is based upon then those, uh, those truths, you see. So um, he's going to go on to um, talk about in, in, in verses 4 and following, you can see how he's going to keep hammering this home. Uh, look at the number of times. I think there's seven times when he talks about one. There is one body, one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. And then he switches over, but it's very similar using the word all, God and Father of all. And he, he means God and Father of all of us, of, of Christians, who is over all and through all and in all. Okay, so um, the emphasis, obviously this is a very, very important doctrine. Let's see what else Lloyd-Jones had to say. Most of the modern talk about unity seems to me to be entirely unscriptural. It is entirely of a human creation. The unity about which the apostle is concerned here is produced and created by the Holy Spirit himself. It is he and he alone that can produce this unity, and it is he alone who, uh, and it is he alone who produces this unity. Um, the apostle makes it quite clear that this is a unity which you and I can never produce. Paul is not even asking us to do so. What he is asking us to do is to be careful not to break the unity that's already there. We are to maintain it, <clears throat> not create it. Okay, you see that then. So, this, you, if, if you get this down, and it's fairly easy to, to get a hold of because it's so cl clear here, then whenever you're approached with this business of, uh, of well, for instance, uh, you can take the churches in our community here, all right? Many of you probably have the same experience. Um, <clears throat> we're not on the same page, all right? Our we're, we, I mean, in our church, we're just not on the same page with the vast majority uh, majority of them we don't recognize that unity of of the spirit and uh, and what happens then is you'll have people then say well you're disrupting the unity of the spirit you're disrupting the unity that Christ would have um, in his church so what what you've got what you've got, got to do is come on you know, we're forming this inner church organization in the community. We're going to have this ministry going. We're going to have these great community song fests and worship times and so forth. And, and you come on and part participate with us. You know, we, we need to show the community that we are one, right? Well, there again is all these efforts to uh, try to produce a man-made unity. And that is not the unity of the Spirit. It's not the unity. If, if um, other churches, other professing Christians, really are Christians, if they're re they really are in Christ, they're really true churches and therefore adhering to Ephesians 1, 1 through 3. You won't have to always be trying to produce a unity by forming organizations. The unity will already be there, you see. And the unity, it'll, all, it'll already be there. And so how do you maintain it? Well, as Paul says, one of the first things to start with is you don't, you don't permit and you don't 
permit it in yourself. You don't permit it in somebody else. You don't permit it, permit someone claiming to be a Christian to start exalting themselves, to start being prideful. You know, I want to big the big big cheese in this kind of a thing here. Look, you know, look at me in, as as a Christian in in this in this community, and uh, and inevitably that pride is going to produce division. It's it's going to interfere with the unity of, of the spirit. It's gonna it's gonna mess things up. Then you see. Um, let's see here. What else? Here's another good one from Lloyd Jones. Nor can this unity ever be felt and experienced or put into practice unless the Holy Spirit is in us and has done His gracious work within me. In other words unless I've been born again. This explains why it's sometimes so difficult to discuss this subject with certain people. They don't agree about the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. They don't agree about the new birth and regeneration. Their idea of Christianity is simply that it means doing good and being moral and religious or taking an interest in a particular denomination and its activities. But you can't have any profitable conversation with them. It's not possible with such people because their whole concept of the Spirit then is, is different. If the Holy Spirit is not in us, we cannot experience this unity. But if the Holy Spirit is present within us and within other, with those others, then that unity will, will necessarily be there, you see. And therefore, he says... To talk glibly and lightly about forgetting our differences and let's just get together and find a common basis or a common denominator. Well, that's to talk about something which is entirely different from what Paul teaches here. Um, if the Spirit of Christ is not present in another person and, it, and he is present in me, we are not going to have fellowship. Notice the, this great benediction, he says, at the end of the second, uh, of Second Corinthians. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. How are we going to have fellowship? You know, lots of times uh, churches have, most churches they'll have uh, a big room all right, a large room, and they'll call it the fellowship hall, fellowship. So we're going to meet together and have potlucks and things, and we'll fellowship. Well, there's a certain kind of fellowship that you can have with other people doing that, but it's not necessarily, it's not the fellowship of the Spirit. The fellowship of the Spirit, and, this, and that's what Paul's talking about here in verse 3, the unity of the Spirit is only produced by the Holy Spirit. It's the fellowship of the Spirit, of the Holy Spirit, you see. And, uh, and that oftentimes can be lacking. You know, in, uh, I think I've got that biography, yeah, well, actually, their autobiography of, because uh, he wrote this, or his wife kind of filled in the blanks, I think, after he died. But, you know, this great two-volume set here, of uh, here's volume one of the autobiography of uh, C.H. Spurgeon, the early years, right? That's another Banner of Truth published book, the early years, and then the full harvest, volume two, C.H. Spurgeon, all right? If you read, my point is that if you read the biography, autobiography of C.H. Spurgeon, you will find, let's see, what did they call it? My memory's bad this morning. Um, the, the, downgrade. the down, that's it, thanks, Berlin remembered. The downgrade controversy. The downgrade controversy. So Spurgeon originally and his church were members of what, what they called the Baptist Union. And it was like a, a fellowship of churches. I don't know if it would really be called a denomination as such, but 
when it was that formal, but it was a fellowship of churches, and it was called the, the Baptist Union. But Spurgeon uh, started seeing troubles brewing. And boy, it's been a long time since I uh, studied the, the nature of that. But I, I bet you, if I remember right, it had to do with uh, the, how Scripture was being regarded. You know, maybe the, the inspiration and inerrancy of Scripture type thing. But there, were, there was a downgrade. Okay, and that's what Spurgeon called it. You know, Spurgeon published a, I don't know if it was weekly, but it was a very regular uh, magazine called The Sword and the Trowel, right? The Sword and the Trowel, named after uh, Nehemiah and his men building the wall, you know, trowel in one hand, sword in the other. And, and uh, so he began to point out in his writing, in, in the Sword and Trowel, uh, the errors. He called it the downgrade controversy. It's like, look at it. This is a slippery slope that we're on here. If you keep going this way, you're going to get further and further and further away from God's truth, from the gospel. And, uh, well, what happens? Typically, this is what happens. And then here's Spurgeon, a great leader, <clears throat> A, great, a man obviously greatly gifted by God had done tremendous, uh, the Lord used him in tremendous ways in his church and far beyond that worldwide. I mean, think about it, we're still reading his sermons today. Um, but um, when he started, so when he started pointing out these errors and this dangerous tendency toward um, some kinds of false doctrine and practice, what happens? Do they listen to him? Do they respect him? No. They started to attack him and criticize him. And, and it was, you know, he suffered a lot as a result. And when he finally withdrew from the Baptist Union, oh man, he, that's the great, and, you, and, and here, you can just hear it, right? It's going to be, you are disobeying uh, Paul's admonition here in Ephesians 4 to be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Well, guess what? Spurgeon was being eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit because the unity of the Spirit produced by the Spirit is only going to be present and cultivated and maintained when the Word of God, inspired by the, the Holy Spirit, is, is strictly and correctly adhered to and preached. And so what Spurgeon was, was doing is saying, you know, if we're, if we're going to have unity here, it has to be, well, as Lloyd-Jones says, <laughs> centered around Ephesians chapters 1 through 3. And, and in other words, the, uh, centered around the, wor the Word of God, you see. The, it was the same with the Reformers. Luther, for example, they were accused, Luther, Calvin, and the other reformers, they were accused by Rome of being what? Divisive. You guys are divisive. You're, you are dividing Christ's church. Well, it was Rome that was being divisive because they were the ones preaching a, a false gospel. And so when the Reformation was happening, and people like Luther and Calvin and so forth are separating from an apostate church, they are being eager to maintain the unity of the... You see that? Eagerness to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace oftentimes evidences itself in separation from that which is, which is not of the Spirit, which is, which is not of Christ. And whatever Paul meant exactly by in the bond of peace, would this would include the fact that you know Luther and Calvin and the reformers, they recognize that that if there's going to be peace, if there's going to be the peace that's produced by the the unity of the Spirit, then 
it's not going to happen as long as this this error is being is being tolerated. So so that's how that's how it works. To be eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace does not mean that you close your eyes to sin and false teaching and say, oh, well, you know, let's just not dwell on that. Uh, let's not, you know, okay, you know, uh, uh, that's going to divide if we make a big deal out of this. Well, yeah, it will, it will separate the, uh, the wheat from the chaff, you see. So we have to be careful here. Paul is not, well, let me back up. We have to be careful here because Rome and other sources of error and false teaching will be very quick to run to these verses here in Ephesians 4 and try to use them to accuse us of being divisive. You see that. That's what they'll do. But the group, the people that are adhering to the truth of God's word are not the ones that are guilty of sinful divisiveness, you see. So anyway, uh, <clears throat> I'll have to read up on that downgrade controversy then um, again. But um, I, I can remember, you know, many of you have experienced the same thing, but I can remember when I was in, uh, the first time I was in uh, Bible college graduate school uh, at the at the Bible college slash seminary that I got my degrees from, but um, I can remember being there, and uh, I guess it was the second time that I went back for that Master of Divinity degree, and it was like the whole character of the place had changed, and they'd gotten another president, and he was one of these mover, shaker, promoter, CEO types, you know, it's going to make things happen. We're going to, we're going to grow the student body. We're going to build buildings. We're going to do, and he was, he was successful at doing that, that sort of thing. But I saw things that were, and it should have been pretty obvious. And I, I imagine there was some other people that had seen the same things, but you can, this downgrade thing. All right, I won't go into all the details, but I wrote to him and I said, you know, uh, this, is a, I, this is problematic to me. I, this is not a good direction that I see. And, you know, his response to me was, you know, Jeff, you're just too judgmental. <laughs> you're too critical. You're too judgmental. Well, guess what? You know, in years since then, um, a lot of the sound doctrine, biblically sound faculty that had been there, they were resigning in droves. Some other new head guy came in, and you wouldn't even recognize the place now. All right, you you wouldn't even you wouldn't even recognize it. So um, this happened. So just mark that down. Eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace does not mean that you never, there's never going to be controversy. We're just going to kind of turn, ignore that kind of an issue, that problem. Well, that guy has that opinion, and so, but we're not going to make a big deal of it. That's not what this means. To be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit means, requires, first of all, yes, humility, gentleness, patience, and so on, and forbearing with, with one another, not being uh, prideful and, and, and puffed up. But with that humility, there's also this strength. You know how um, Moses, Moses was called, I think it's in Deuteronomy somewhere, Moses was called the, the meekest man that ever was in Israel. And yet, at the same time, what do you see about Moses? He was meek and gentle, but at the same time, at the same time, when uh, wickedness was to be confronted, he did it, and he did he did it with God's with God's authority. 
all of those things are involved in maintaining the unity of, of the Spirit. <clears throat> Let's see here now. Um, there's, uh, there's plenty more here that, that um, he, that Lloyd-Jones has here. So you know, here are a couple more, couple more points on humility and, and, and fighting against pride in ourselves here. Uh, the Apostle Peter gives us a similar exhortation in a very striking manner. In 1 Peter, he says, Yes, all of you be subject to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Uh, gird yourself with the towel of humility. Stoop right down, Lloyd-Jones says, and wash the feet of others. This is a secret of preserving the unity of the spirit in the, in the bond of peace. And then by way of self-examination, you know, so this is to be our fundamental disposition and character. Let's ask ourselves, are we humble? Let no man think himself above that which he ought to think, says the Apostle Paul. Let him that thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. It's our wrong conceits of ourselves that cause division. One man might be proud of his birth. You know, I am of a noble family. Uh, <clears throat> another is proud of his money. Another is proud of his nationality, his status, his business skills. And then another one comes along and is proud of his IQ, his intelligence, his understanding of doctrine. He's so proud of it that he causes division and denies the, and thereby denies the very doctrine that he claims to know so, so well. This is great. He, he, uh, I'd heard, I think I'd read before that that Lloyd Jones, uh, one of Lloyd Jones' uh, heroes, you might say, was Oliver Cromwell. A lot of people, just like they hate Calvin, they hate Oliver Cromwell. But Oliver Cromwell was a, was a great a great Christian man, and uh, and in regard to humility, Lloyd Jones uh, said that Oliver Cromwell said to certain Scottish church leaders. Uh, where there was, there was some controversy going on there. I think maybe even war. Didn't, Cromwell may have even had gone to war with Scotland. At, at any rate, he said to them, I beseech you by the mercies of Christ, consider it possible that you might be mistaken. <laughs> you know, that's, uh, that's humility, as Lloyd-Jones says. You know, just stop a minute. Consider it, it, you know, it just could be possible that I'm wrong, that I'm mistaken. And, uh, and, and so that, that's another aspect of maintaining the unity of, of the Spirit, you see. Um, now he's going to go on, and, and we'll get into this more deeply next time, but because Paul goes on here then, as I've said, in verses 4 and following with this repetition of one, 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 all, all, all. And, uh, and here, this matter of, we, we look at, we need to recognize if we're going to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which we've been called, then we've got to get it through our heads and be constantly reminded that there's one body, one spirit, okay, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. So to the degree that genuine Christians now, let's just talk about genuine Christians, people are really that are really born again. As long as we're in this present world, in this flesh that still has, we've still got sin in us, right? Um, <clears throat> we are not going to arrive in this present life, we are not going to re, uh, arrive at perfection, uh, perfection of understanding, say perfection in a lot of ways. Glorification would be the biblical word. word. But in this life, we are always going to be defective, lacking 
in our understanding of the things of Christ. Now, as we're longer, the longer we're Christians, we should be growing in those things, growing in our understanding of the Lord and knowledge of the Lord, knowing Him and so forth. But there, we're still going to have, we're still going to have some deficiencies, plenty of them, plenty of things that we don't fully, fully under, understand, right? But that doesn't mean that there's differences in the faith, differences in baptism, differences in, in the Lord, right? Look at, there's only one Lord, only one Lord Jesus. There's only one Christian faith that's been once for all delivered to us. There's only one baptism. Now think about that. And what does that mean? You know, what does that mean? Um, is it the baptism of the Spirit? I'm not sure, but one thing's for sure, right? And this has always kind of uh, been interesting to me, is that genuine Christians, I mean true brothers and sisters in Christ, cannot agree, even if they want it, even they want to, right? They're being honest with one another, you know, talk to me about your position here on baptism, and then I'll talk to you. And we're being genuine with one another, but, but we, we still, we can't quite see it. We can't quite see the other approach. Some people baptize infants, and some Christians don't. You know, and so that, but that's just an example. There's obviously only one baptism. And to the degree that Paul might be talking about water baptism there, I think he's probably still talking about the baptism of the Spirit too there. But, but to the degree that there's just one, somebody's wrong, right? See, you see that? In the, and that's just one issue there. Calvin and Luther couldn't agree on the exact nature of the Lord's Supper. I mean, the, these two giants of the Christian faith, they couldn't agree. They do now, but, but think about it. There's only one real doctrine of the Lord's Supper. It's that which Christ gave, okay? Well, in this life, there's going to be these differences. And, and, if, and so we've got to be humble and recognize, you know what? I haven't arrived yet. I don't have all the answers. Now, I've got, a, I've got enough knowledge to know, for example, that Christ is the Son of God, that Christ is God. I mean, I know, that I know basics here that I can confidently say anybody that denies the deity of Christ is wrong. That's heresy. I'm right. They're wrong on that one. Okay? But then there's going to be all these other issues that genuine Christians have differences on. But the reality is that there's only one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, and uh, one body, one church, one spirit, right? And so what we are all trying to do is to, and, and the Lord's trying to, by His Spirit, to bring us to that perfection. In fact, Paul's going to say that. Let's see here now. Uh, yeah, see, down here in uh, verse 11, and then we'll, I'll just read this and then we'll end. But He gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. Now check this out until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. That, I bet Lloyd-Jones is going to have a whole lot to say about that when we get there. But necessarily that tells us what? We haven't attained it yet. We have not all attained to the unity. We're moving toward it. We're moving toward it, but but we haven't arrived and we won't as long as we are in this, in this present life, you see. So this requires, 
If we're going to maintain the unity of the Spirit, this requires humility, right? And uh, so there it is. Well, we'll plan to pick up next time and talk some more about verses 4, 5, and 6. And uh, we'll once again call on Martin Lloyd-Jones to uh, help us out here. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for your church. Thank you for Christ. Thank you for the unity of the Spirit that your Spirit produces among all of your true people. We ask that you would forgive us for our bent toward arrogance and pride. We pray that we would be uh, humble, that we'd be kind and loving toward one another, and at the same time that we would stand firmly for the truths of the gospel that you've given to us. And we pray all of this in Christ's name. Amen.